think the, uh, the thing that came true loud and clear to me after interviewing these 200 veterans was the impressive resolve, ingenuity, and commitment of the enemy that we faced in Vietnam. And I would like to impart that to you by uh, a series of uh, stories that I think will, will carry that theme through. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The Ho Chi Minh Trail was the logistical lifeline that the North Vietnamese used to get supplies from uh, North uh, Vietnam down to South Vietnam. Uh, those of you that have studied the geography of Vietnam know that uh, the only direct the, the most obvious route was uh, Coastal Highway 1 along the uh, east coast of Vietnam, but uh, obviously uh, transiting that highway would uh, expose you to air attack. So they developed a network of roads uh, further to the west that uh, consisted primarily of five north-south routes and several dozen east-west routes. The, uh, all during the war, it was a cat and mouse game in which we we try to locate these uh, road networks and we would attack them by air, in some cases attack them on the ground. And the uh, burden was on the Vietnamese to <coughs> keep uh, fooling us as to where the uh, transportation routes were. One way that they did this, they knew that we would send uh, observation aircraft out to uh, see where they were crossing the rivers. So obviously, if you saw a bridge, that would be the most obvious place that they were, they were uh, transiting. Uh, they knew we would do this, so what they did was they started building uh, decoy bridges out of bamboo that could not support the weight of, of a truck or troops. They float it into position, uh, secure it, and then uh, we would spot it, send the aircraft in to knock it out. We'd go back fat and happy thinking that we knocked out a bridge. Well, at night, what uh, happened was they had built uh, very cleverly a bridge that was inflatable. They had used row after row of truck inner tube uh, connected with hoses and a uh, pump on either bank and they would crank this thing up just after uh, the sun went down. The bridge, the tires would inflate, and on top of these, these uh, uh, inner tubes was a uh, wooden platform. They would secure the platform in place and run traffic across it all night. About an hour before daybreak, they would deflate the bridge and it would sink back beneath the river. We never knew that bridge existed. That was just one example. Another thing they would do, they, uh, they knew that we would look for tire marks on uh, roads that we were able to identify to see uh, if there had been any truck activity. They had their engineers come in and they, they noticed that in many cases some of these north-south roads uh, were paralleled by shallow rivers and creeks. They had their engineers go in and grade the rivers. And what they would do at night is they would send their trucks in the rivers. So obviously there would be no, no tire marks visible the next day when we sent our observation aircraft down. Again, another uh, uh, sign of their ingenuity. The, uh, some of you may have studied in the southern part of Vietnam, about 40 miles from the capital of Saigon, was uh, a network of tunnels, the Gucci Tunnel System. This was a uh, tunnel system that was 250 kilometers underground. They could uh, transit from village to village. Uh, we, we found out, we first found out the, uh, the, the tunnel system existed in 1965 during Operation Crimp. There were a number of places in which the enemy could uh, pop up. Uh, in this Operation Crimp, we were doing what was called a hammer and anvil uh, operation where we were using the Saigon River as the anvil and troops were sweeping through to uh, uh, trap any Viet Cong enemy forces that were in between the river and the advancing troops. The troops made it all the way to the river and didn't encounter a single uh, Viet Cong. They then started to backtrack and they located a tunnel opening. As a group of uh, uh, soldiers uh, stood around looking, uh, watching this tunnel opening, a Viet Cong popped up from another location and killed two or three of the Army soldiers. Uh, as soldiers went over to investigate that opening, another Viet Cong popped up somewhere else and shot a couple more soldiers. This was a constant uh, thorn in our side during the war. We were never able to dislodge the Viet Cong from that tunnel system. We came up with uh, a lot of ways of trying to get them out. One way, we, uh, there was, we found an opening near the, uh, the Saigon River and we hooked up a hose and a pump and tried to flood them out like gophers. This uh, worked a couple of times, but then they developed a very intricate system of trap doors where they were actually able to seal off uh, uh, approaches to the tunnel so they were able to prevent the water from going all the way through the system. We, uh, we would try using tear gas. 
Initially, their defense against tear gas, they were taught to uh, urinate in a handkerchief and put it over their nose and mouth, and that would, uh, the, the ammonia from the, uh, uh, the urine would help to uh, uh, screen the, uh, the uh, tear gas coming, from coming through. Uh, after that, what they came up with was a system of, of uh, having a U-drain a built where you had a tunnel going like tunnel like this and we would start putting tear gas in it they developed a system where they would plug this in and they would build a u-drain like this and they would fill this with water so that the tear gas could not penetrate from this cavity over into this one of course it made it a little difficult for them what they would have to do is they'd hold their breath go under uh, go through the u-drain and pop up on the other side of the tunnel The, uh, their ability to assess uh, what our strengths and weaknesses were. Obviously, uh, our greatest strength was our firepower. They recognized this. They recognized the fact that uh, when we first came over that the, US, the United States had never been defeated in a war. Uh, they quickly assessed that what they needed to do was to adopt a, a policy of what they called holding on to the belt of the enemy. In other words, you stayed so close to the enemy that you denied him the opportunity to use his artillery and his air power against you. And that is constantly what they did. They would, they would stay very close to our forces. They would strike. They would mass just before a strike. They would hit. And then they would break up into very small units. So it made it very difficult to, to try and pursue them after they, they uh, uh, did strike. The, uh, uh, I interviewed a doctor, Dr. Lee Caldai, who uh, put together a field hospital in, in, in Hanoi, then had to take it down the Ho Chi Minh Trail and uh, set it up in uh, southern Vietnam. He lost 90% of his medical supplies and equipment going down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, this, however, did not deter him from carrying out his responsibilities. What he did was he immediately made use of anything available that he could, and he found out that uh, uh, he was getting his, uh, most of his supplies directly from the U.S. government. Our soldiers would, uh, our, our aircraft would drop uh, uh, parachute flares at night. These were uh, small parachutes that had a flare on it that would light up an area at night so you could observe the activity on the ground. The next day they would go out and collect these. They would tear up the parachutes and use those as bandages. They would use the, the lines for sutures. They were able to use some of the containers to uh, make stethoscopes. They uh, found uh, empty uh, soda bottles and, and beer bottles and they would melt these down and. Uh, and make uh, uh, the, uh, the vials for their, uh, their medications. They would uh, strip a uh, helicopter wreck or an airplane wreck. They would take the, remove the wire and uh, use the rubber uh, tube to, uh, to make an IV for their, their soldiers. Uh, because they lacked electricity in the field, doctors and nurses had to donate their own blood uh, before or after surgery. They, uh, when they conducted operations underground, they would have a soldier pedaling a bike hooked up to a generator, and that was the only way they were able to provide light for their, uh, their operations. Uh, just an extremely difficult uh, time for them. They, they conducted uh, brain surgery without anesthesia. Uh, they would have to hold the patient down and wait until he, he uh, uh, finally fainted, and then they could complete the surgery. But uh, all in all, I found them a, a very committed people, a very resourceful people. Uh, you're talking about the, the, the things we did wrong in Vietnam. I think we had the, the key to uh, a successful foreign policy towards Vietnam over 2,000 years ago. Some of you may know of Sun Tzu, the uh, Chinese uh, strategist who uh, wrote the book, The Art of War. And one of his principles in The Art of War is never engage an enemy on the battlefield unless you know him first. And I think that was our, our biggest failure in the war. We never did understand the enemy. Understanding <coughs> that everything had been done wrong at that point. In my judgment, because the United States still had a very respectable probability of being able to achieve a true Vietnam outcome. Uh, just as we achieved a true German outcome, the Germany outcome at the end of World War II, out of half a nation. Just as we achieved a true Korea 
outcome in the Korean War out of half of the nation. Uh, the same thing was in theory possible, but it was destroyed by the great constitutional crisis of Watergate, and perhaps uh, the greatest mistake of all. <laughs>